good morning or, or evening or whatever it is where you are. We let's see, it's ten fifteen local Carabas time. We are on an unnamed seamount that we are referring to as Te Tarena, which means uh, little sister, right next to. Rawaki Island, where we were yesterday, just a few miles away. Um, we're at about 1,580 meters, and we're just setting up here to sample this uh, Paramaricia octocoral, one of the species that we work on a lot in the Gulf of Mexico and actually all over the world. I think the whole thing, because the we want the ophiroid too. That's good. Nice grab. We mapped the seamount for the first time last night. Um, and it turns out the summit is a little shallower than we thought from the old very, very coarse bathymetry that we had. Um, so we're at about 1,600 meters now, and we'll be climbing up to just shallower than 900 meters over the next 12 hours or so. So I hope you didn't have anything planned. Lots of exciting stuff coming up. This is uh, this coral and this ophiroid is known to be a mutualistic symbiosis, at least in other parts of the world, where they both benefit each other. The ophiroid cleans off the coral, and the coral polyps underneath where the ophiroid can reach are generally more healthy than they are further away. The ophiroid gets uh, a little bit of elevation up off the seafloor and some food. place to live. You can just red stopper that. Oh, you want to do it with this guy? Okay. Nope, oh, wrong way, sorry. Alexis would like that Umbalula, which is right out here. Yeah. It's a C pen. So it should come out pretty easily as a little anchor kind of in the sediment. Uh, could be. Sorry, I can't really tell how big it is exactly. They're also really squishy, so if you do put it in, it will just bend itself. How's the stock? The stock is um. It's, uh, it's a little more solid, but it's pretty thin. So should we break it close to the ball, like the main body? Yeah, if you grip, if you grip in the back, it might 
the whole thing might just come out. It's not really attached. Yeah. It's, it's kind of in the sediment. Oh, there it goes. Look. It's all closed up. Look at that. There we go. Mm, yeah, it might be kind of tall, huh? Yeah, you might want the box. <laughs> box. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, we could just, um, you could probably go in a quiver and just fold that in. been eating. Feeding. You can see stuff in its gut unless it's uh, or it's ripe. I'm not sure. We'll have to see when we get it back.
Yeah. Sticky. Uh oh. Can you push this cruise button for me? Which one? From the blue, up, bottom, bottom, pick up. Thank you. You can just cut the end Ah, oh, come on. Jeez. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm gonna come up and rotate. Wait, stay on the box. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So what we're gonna do? I'll explain. Yeah. I'm gonna come up. And then I'm gonna rotate, yep. and then the current's gonna blow okay. it over, and then we're gonna close yeah, the box. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see how that goes. Yes, leave it for the next watch. <laughs> Get a little Probably gift for you. <laughs> I know, that's weird.
Over. You want me? Sure. Oh, you were talking to me. Maybe next time.
Yeah. It is. More so than it appeared. <laughs> Which is good for us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'll find something else for you in a second. Whew. Yeah, we're coming up. Sea cucumber. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Lots of crinoids again. Looking straight up the hill. This, yeah, this is weird. This should, well, it's very strange. Check this out. Right in here. Yeah, well, I saw when you were pushing it, it was bending down, but it's just two flex one. Would be what? Oh, really? Could be. I think you might be right. Big C pen.
Another Umbalula, a bunch of crinoids. This is a cool one right here. Oh, man. You max out that zoom, it really goes. Oh, there's a swimming. You got a swimmer. Levitating. <laughs> Barrel roll. Barrel roll. Ah, he's showing off. Sweet moves. Come on, focus. Hey, found a friend. Look at that. Alright. <coughs> Carry on. Oh, I'm just watching this eel. Slippery. Oh, look at that. It's pretty. Can you hold right here for a second? I'm trying to play with the dogs and I'm just like this one. 
was trying to get back in the shot. Nice there. That's an hour. <laughs> I'll stop. I'm not moving. You got it. thinking that was umbellopathies when we came in. Those are big stock crinoids. It's cool. Yeah. yeah well. safe. Okay. No, no, we'll keep going. They're safe. No, it's uh, it's kind of sea star. See, it sort of has five arms in the middle if you look at it. All right, should you keep going? No, that's its stock. But yeah, they grow like that. back there. Putting the stern on the waypoint? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Just checking. Oh, 
with like a little crab on it. Oh, sorry. Maybe, yeah. Huh. Word of tubes? Some type of little half tube. Is that a cup coral? I don't know. What is that? It's tiny, whatever it is. It's as far as I can zoom. I think it might be. Could be. I think it is. Yeah, it's fire and iskin. I know, sorry. So we found a little solitary cup coral, which is a hard coral. We're interested in taking a water sample here to know what the water chemistry is like, um, to learn more about where they're able to calcify, how they're able to live this deep. I'm Alexis Weinig, by the way. Eric stepped away for a second. I work with him at Temple University. We're gonna fire a Niskin real quick, Randy. Sure, she kind of come We did a little, a little one. Nice. Yellow is the Yeah. 
great. So we decided the monkey's fist worked the best for... Yeah, it's just the way that the tubing were like got tight because you had so many running through it. Yeah. The, one, the ones that were closer for active being the ones that had more bending as well. Yeah. Sometimes you see it just wears up. Yep. You can just keep heading on. Hmm? I know it does. They look like little flowers. All those crinoids out there. You're driving. You have to take Squiddle back. All right. Alexis, this is yours. It's not, but I'm oh, sorry. I thought it was someone else. I'm sorry. I thought it was yours. All right. Let me just get my bearings here as I figure out what we're doing. I see some sea pens coming up. A bunch of crinoids in Crinoid City, it looks like, huh? So I'm Randy Virgin. I'm from Boston University, and I somebody gave me the camera. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Good job. Thanks, Eric. Take notes. I won't take. I won't forget to take notes. I will take notes. Copious. Copious amounts of notes. So. And he's out of the room. No transitions. All right, we have a big bamboo whip coral coming up. And let's see, maybe we can get some lasers on base there just to get a sense of it. That's okay, guys. So if you're just tuning in for the first time, we have two lasers that we can project with the ROV, which are 10 centimeters apart. And if we shine them at the base, it gives us a sense of scale. Um, and this is a very tall whip coral, but I'm having trouble figuring out exactly how tall it is without a sense of scale here. I don't see the lasers yet. Right here, and I'm just missing them. Turn the iris down a little. Oh, there they are. Whoa. That is a very tall, <laughs> that's got to be at least a meter tall, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's taller than the ROV. Can we take a quick scan up that, guys? So it's really interesting. It's got um, these, all bamboo corals have these black nodes in the middle, but this one is, doesn't seem to have too many polyps at the base. They start, gosh, it looks like almost, <laughs> almost a foot up. And then here we go up. Well, you can just get the alpha. Even with the, Ooh. Like this is about the basket level, right? Yeah. Is that your I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Yeah. I sure did. I'm just one. Um, just getting my, getting my bits. This is great. Wow, look at that. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> uh. Uh, is this going to reach the surface, guys? <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, let's have a little competition. Who wants to guess its height? Can we go back down, actually? Six You're going to kill me. Yeah, six meters. And now altimeter. Really? Over six meters off the bottom. Oh my goodness, this is six meters <laughs> off the bottom. That is unbelievably tall. 
Uh, I can't ask you to go back to the bottom again, or is that too hard for so much? That'd be great. This is a large bamboo whip coral that is six meters. Uh, so in the family I saw today, close to seven meters off the bottom of the seafloor. It's likely um, lepidisis. Lepidisis. Oh, wait. bamboo corals. There's a lot of debate on the clades of those corals, but um, lepidisis is a pretty safe call, according okay. to Steve back home. All right. Oh, I, you know what? I need to open up my uh, Slack channel. We are lucky enough to have Alexis Whining and uh, Taste Tech Yao in the back here squiddling and helping us annotate and ID everything. And we're also really lucky to have Steve Vaskovich at home, Shoreside, who is one of the lead so science leads on the Noah Okeanos expedition that came to this area in March. We are partnered with them since Noah has helped to support this Schmidt Ocean Institute cruise and uh, he is also helping us to identify everything. This is unbelievable! Look how tall this is! This is we have, they did sample these previously with Okeanos. Okay good. I don't think we're going to sample it. I just want to take a look at that little red thing that we saw near the bottom in a little bit of detail. So, guys, I'm trying. You, there was a little. Do you remember that little ice pod, or maybe it was a, a Nidarian? I'm not really sure which. It was all the way near the base. We got to go <laughs> six meters down. <laughs> this crazy thing <laughs> to take a look, a little look at that. We're interested in associates of corals. So, associates meaning um, other critters which are cohabiting, um, using the coral as habitat. And sometimes as food and sometimes as we don't know what. There's a whole lot of reasons why this could work. So um, we are trying to get a handle on who is living with whom, how they get there, why they're there, and whether or not they're there to mutual benefit or not. Oh, there we go. That's what I want. Uh, this is indeed a, oh, I'm not going to sample it because it's so far down on this coral. Where's squishy fingers? But I want a really close image. I think this is a putatively predatory cnidarian that has been, we previously got fooled on an earlier dive into thinking it might actually be a completely different phylum, <laughs> thinking it might be an echinoderm. But it's not. It's cnidarian, and we think. And it has been landing on these corals, and we don't know what it's doing there. And one hypothesis that we have is that it might be eating it. I don't know if we can set and get a close look. If not, that's okay. Just let me know so I don't zoom. Can you borrow that real quick? Sure can. I'm, I have one of my jellies that I'm going to try to take a close look at here, Eric. I'm pretty excited. We took some microscope pictures on last night. The same kind? Um, not yeah. the same, no. Was it? No. It's a different type of Medusa, but... Are you sure? Sure. Yeah, it was not that color. It was dark. One of the issues here is that we um we all have different shifts as we work 24-hour operations, so I definitely missed some things last night. I'm trying to catch up. All right, I'm going to scroll up here, find my little guy. There he is. And take a close look in this crinoid forest. Thank you. With a singular seven meter <laughs> bamboo whip coral. All right, who is living on this guy? Ooh, oh, who put me in charge? Let's see if I can get the iris down. Actually, I don't know if the iris. Oh, I'm trying, can we maybe turn the lights down slightly so we can get a better, oop. You should be able to, um, just ask them, are you guys on auto iris or auto iris? There's a button on there at the top of that. Yeah. It is in auto iris. Okay. Oh wait, I've got what I need. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Thank you, backlight. That's what I'm looking for. So I want to take a look at this thing. So this looks like it is set down directly over a polyp. Oh yeah, it's right on top. Right on top. And this is the hypothesis we've been working with. And it's got these little tentacles that it uses to kind of anchor itself. It's also super interesting. The polyps are closed all just around that, that area. So they definitely are detecting there's some type of motion happening there. Exactly. And I think it might be sucking the polyp out of it. Yes. Now, are the polyps closed or are they gone? That's my question. No, those are closed. So that's what they look like when we... Um, if they were gone, there would not be any, like tissue there. Okay, so maybe this little Medusa is just sucking a little mucus Look off the top. Him, yeah. He's just 
<laughs> but look at him. He's just he looks like he's yeah, drinking from a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have kids, so Yes. Uh, now, you, oh, you want to try a slurp gun? Uh, you think we can do it without well, hurting the coral? But it's very fragile, right? We don't want to hurt the coral on this one. I think we're going to you know what? We've seen enough of these. We're going to find another one. And the, they're very small. It would probably be easier to sample them with a coral if we find one later on that we want. All right, we're going to come back to this. So I let's um let's we're not going to sample this coral at all. We're going to let this seven meter beast be, and we're going to appreciate this imagery, but um, move on. So thanks a lot, pilots. That was awesome. And we, if we find another one of these itsy bitsy little guys, I promise you, slurp, we will slurp away. <laughs> it's it's such a fragile coral, and it's seven meters tall, Russ. Seven. <laughs> oh, let me zoom out here. Whoa! I told you. Six, six point something. I didn't catch it. And we're back. All right, so uh, we have just heard from our shoreside support that these are pretty flexible and hardy, but um, we are already moving past, so we will try again some other time. But I, you know, previously we've seen those little cnidarians on Eritagorgia, and so it's nice to see it on a completely different kind of coral. It makes me wonder if they are generalist coral huggers, I'm going to say for right now, because we don't know whether or not they're just giving them a little hug and taking a break or slurping something right off. But they, it looks like they may have a specialized, um, I guess I'll call it an organ or a piece of morph their morphology under the bell that is perfect for landing right over the top of a coral polyp and taking a little taste. But that is a working hypothesis that I reserve the right to <laughs> revise dramatically <laughs> at some point. So we'll play with that. We are going over this this beautiful lunar landscape, um, and we are on um, Te Tarina um, Seamount in the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. This place has never before been explored. Um, the name in Kiribati means sister, and it is right up next to uh, Rawake Island, which we looked at yesterday. And so this is we're calling it a sister seamount. While we're talking about sisters, I think it's worth mentioning, something we haven't really talked about yet, that the Phoenix Islands Protected Area actually has a sister site, which is Papahana Makuakea in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And those two, these two protected areas were born, if you will, the same year, 2008, and have partnered together to try to um, talk about the challenges and benefits of being a very large MPA um, in a very remote and uninhabited area. And there's a lot of similarities there. And it's part of that partnership with the United States that has brought us um, together on this ship, looking at all these corals, in partnership with the Schmidt Ocean Institute and with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. Let's take a look. Let's see. I'm wondering what this is, kind of beyond the, if that's a Norelid or, yeah, I don't know if we can get over there. All right, what do we think this is? This is a primnoid, Alexis? You can't really tell. Can we, can we can take a careful look at this? I like the branching pattern of it. I don't know if we've seen it yet on this dive. I'm kind of just getting into the hot seat, getting my bearings. Can I zoom down or not yet? Okay. Oh, there's another one of these beautiful branched stalked crinoids, which we don't know what they are, but somebody else in the world probably does. Oh, yeah. What do you think it is? 
You think it's a primnoid? Alexis? Yeah. Yep. We do. So I'm going to putatively call this Norella. Whoa, who let me drive again? I'll, I'll get it right, guys, I promise. What? I want the white one. Sorry if I'm in the way. So, um, but I, all the polyps are not pointing. I can't tell. Yeah, they are. I know, it's super tricky. It actually looks maybe more like a plexara than yeah. a primnoid. Now that we're close up, I agree with you. Um, this is why we zoom, guys. This is why we zoom. Yeah, I would definitely have to look into <laughs> my guide for more on... But it definitely looks like a primnoid and not a plexara. Those polyps are um, not quite Should so armored like they are with plexaridae. Okay. Um, they're a lot more squishy if you will I like the base and so it's you see how the branching kind of happens just a little bad maybe an inch or two up off the base so um Steve's saying from knowing but he thinks maybe delayed too so yeah maybe. so well I'm gonna zoom in one more time and just make sure I don't see any any branches any nodes which I do not see please confirm Alexis yeah I don't okay see all right and we will think about that ID and get back to you on it but yeah. um let's keep going, but, but let's keep going. sounds great Thanks, guys. Yeah, there was a little a little shrimp on it. I saw its glowing eyes. This is a really nice setup here because you can see the stalked crinoid next to the benthic atta benthically attached but still mobile crinoid with a really pretty white coral in the middle that we are going to try to make sure we have a correct on ID, ID on. Oops. Not a bamboo coral, probably a primnoid. I'm gonna guess with, I like Norella, so I'm gonna start with that, but we may revise that in a bit. Okay, we're gonna f fly in here. So we now, I've just had a shift change. We now have Bob and Russ at the helm. Thanks guys. Awesome. What's this? My nose. <laughs> oh, I have a microphone sponge. I don't really understand the purpose of these sponges. Yeah, let's keep going. So, last night we had a little conversation. Um, if you weren't present for it, I'll fill you in about the major difference. Ooh, let's take a quick look at this urchin. Just a quick, just to, just to document that it's here. Um, we had a little conversation about islands versus seamounts. Yesterday we were diving on the slopes of an island. Today we are diving on the slopes of a seamount. In many ways similar, but of course an island breaks the surface. But these are right next to each other. Beautiful. Thanks, guys. You can really see it's, um, I'm going to zoom back out here. Really see the, uh, the classic sort of pentacular radial symmetry of the echinoderm family there. And there's a really neat sort of shape to it. Not, not as uh, spherical as we usually see with urchins. <laughs> Okay, so we are flying over this substrate, and you know, if we were to zoom in at any point, we would see tons of little stuff, all kinds of great recruits and little organisms that are tucked into every nook and cranny. You know, it looks like there's nothing here, but it's really, mis there's actually tons. But we are on the hunt trying to characterize the major habitats, and we're attempting something like a thousand meter transect. So we, we, we can't stop to look all the time, but I will, I will kind of zoom in in a little bit. Here's a couple more of these um, coming up, but we will, we are specifically really interested in deep sea corals, given the fact that you have a bunch of coral biologists at the helm this time. So we love corals all the time. Corals are animals. There's been a little chatter on this on our YouTube channel and previous dives, so let me just clarify that corals are animals in the class Anthozoa, which translates to flower animal. And when we see all of these little polyps, all of these little florets, those are 
essentially mouths in the same colony. So we have one colony and they're all genotypically identical with multiple mouths and each mouth can be considered an individual on a colony. And so that's how these coral animals, that's their MO, that's how they do their thing. All right, ooh, look at this slope. Yeah, we found ourselves in quite a few caves last night. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna try to avoid getting ourselves going spelunking, as somebody had said in the back. But, but we are definitely gonna get a close look at this, at this substrate. I'm gonna zoom in if that's okay with you, Russ. And just see if, see if I can get a handle on what we might be seeing here. See, what did you say? So already we can see some pteropod shells. I see some um, some little echinoderms and some little sponge recruits. There's tons of stuff in here. Um, what is that? Uh, a little bit of, it looks like a tiny sponge and here's a crinoid attached. So really it's, it's all the deep sea substrate. Oh, there we go. It was a little guy. Can we take a look at that coral or are we in a bad position? It's just so small. So, you know, we've, we've seen this one before. Let's just keep climbing. Thank you. Um, but it already has no freud on it. So I just wanted to make a note of that for Tim. Um, oh, Metallogorgia again, the no freud. We saw a bunch of metallogorgia yesterday. We were in a sort of metallogorgid forest right around the same depth. How um, come I can't change the ship color? How <laughs> come it's hot pink and I can't change it? Um, we are scanning the seafloor looking for stuff. This is really awesome brown. I mean, this is perfect. It's got really lightly sedimented, really knobby, but. Um, sloped well enough that there should be lots of current for food to pass by and these knobs are great because they give organisms a good chance to set down and uh, if I were to let me zoom out I can show you a little bit more of how um, how neat this topography really is and so I think we have a pretty high chance of seeing some great stuff we're just kind of kind of move around a little bit and get our bearings and start to get a little bit of habitat characterization so, corals really like these steep slopes because they um, act kind of as, as the boundary, they're right at the boundary of currents often, and so current, current will whip by, and when current whips past, so does food. And so if you rely, oh, there's a holothurian up there? If you rely on the current to deliver your meals, then being in a place where the current is, has a fast delivery system, fast food, if you will, probably a good thing. Uh, there's another, you know, I'm going to take another look at that coral that's right up there. It's the same, it's it's less branched, but it's the same one. And we've seen a bunch of them now, but this seems like a good spot to take a better look. And there's something on him. Can't quite tell what it is yet. Let's take a close look. Another little crinoid? Is it? All right, and here, let me just scan over. I can't quite get the iris down here. I'm trying to pull it him. Just tried that. Well, sorry guys, but we're a little blown out because it's such bright sand behind us, but we're getting a sense of this. I don't see any nodes, but I can't tell if that's Is it the other way? Nope, wrong way. Just do some off for you. Oh, thank you. So I'm trying to get a little more contrast so I can check more carefully for some nodes here to see if this is a bamboo coral. Oh, there we go. Thanks, guys. It's great. Oh, is that a holothurian? Oh, if it does, I won't complain. Those are cool. Um, just before we, are you, are you, are you sitting <laughs> down with yeah, the RV just, right I'm now? Just sitting, Do we have a sample of this guy yet? Uh, 
Steve had asked for No, he didn't actually. I think we're good. Unless you want one. I think we're gonna keep going. All right, thanks guys. Keep flying. Deb, whenever we get one of those close-ups on polyps, I forgot to ask, but can I just ask for a default uh, snap uh, still? I've been trying to zoom in on something. You just got to hold it a little bit longer. Perfect. Kind of thing, but yeah. That'd be yeah, great. But if there's something really specific, then just get my attention. Perfect. But yes. When you're zoomed in, I try to snap. Especially that little, like, those little uh, Nidarian. Yeah, so it's hard for the family. Oh, we're going to take a look at this Aritagordia yeah. in some detail. Sorry to make you sit down again. Now I'm going to try to turn the light up. I'm very picky about lighting today. Um, so we saw a lot of those um, medusae on a Ritagordia in a previous dive, right around this depth. Okay, so Aritagorgia is absolutely one of my favorites. Um, let me pan right here. Ah, uh, here we go. This is gonna be a treat. Let's start at the very bottom and see what this orange critter is that I can't quite make out. Is it a hermit crab? Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. So, oh, no, maybe the sand is oolitic. There it is. So we've got a great little hermit crab um, waving at us. Mm. Really cute. It does have, is that a sponge covered arm? That's what it looks like, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got Bob Waters, who's one of our ROV pilots, who's, who's said quite aptly that it looks like it's got a sponge covered arm, which makes it look like it's in a cast. Recover quickly, little guy. Recover quickly. Should we sign his cast, guys? Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Ah, <laughs> uh, good point. Let's let him go. So let's uh, let's start at the base here, and see what we can find. I am specifically looking for one of those little cnidarians that we can suction sample. Um, so if anybody sees one, shout it out. So I'm doing a very careful scan, out of focus scan. Sorry, I'll get there. Autofocus is focusing on the back here. Mm, I think I'm making it worse, not better. Uh. Yeah, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. See if I can get it. Well, we'll just keep going up. And if, okay. Oh, good. Thanks, guys. Oh, here we go. Uh, no, we'll just keep zooming. We'll keep working our way up here. Switch the manual and zoom back in. Uh, zoom back. I'll give this one more try, and if I can't get it there, I will go to manual. Manual well, control. You need to, you need yeah, to you beat, zoom out until it's in focus, and then hit manual, and then zoom back. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right, hold on. Hold on. Driving lessons over here. All right, so I'm in focus right now. So now I, I hit, hit manual. manual, and now I get to zoom back in. Smart. Look at that. Look at those beautiful polyps. Ah, so pretty. Oops. Stunning. Um, I think there's just a little bit of um, schmutz in the base. There may be one dead polyp, but I don't see anything that looks particularly disturbing. This is a really nice branch because we can see some that are open and some that are closed, right? You know what it makes me think of? Birds on a telephone wire. I don't know why, but there we go. All right, let's see, let's see what we got here. We are searching for pulsing medusae, pur pulsing little purplish medusae on the Ceritogorgia, which doesn't typically have associates on it. And I think it's as far as high as I can go. 
Um, I'm in a weird position. Russ, is it possible for me to get a glimpse to the top? We're kind of in a weird spot here. Yes. Or not so much. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a Ritagorgia, but it looks like probably like a more, so we have Steve Shoreside, Steve Askovich, who's saying that this is more like a Rodana Ritagorgia because it has a wavy axis, not mm -hmm. helical. And that is a cool character that I hadn't picked up on, but I think you're 100% right now that you say it. So thanks, Steve, for the clarification. And we're getting a good view on this. And while it is stunning, I don't think I see one of my little my little Nidarians, but let's just appreciate and document the fact that we have a Rodana Ritagorgia, which I don't think we've seen before. Have we logged it yet? Um, no. Nope. So that's our first documentation of that on uh, this dive and probably in the whole trip so far. So thanks, pilots. That was a really good view. We'll keep going. I'm going to span scan over this way here. And we're going to keep flying. All right. You know, not only is this the first time anybody has explored this, but this is the first time really, I think this has been even tentatively named. So we are calling this Seamount de Tarina, which means little sister of um, Rowake, which is where we are, were yesterday. And as you can see, there's no light down here except for what we shine. We are almost just about 1500 meters below the surface of the ocean. And all of these critters are living in extremely zero light, low temperature, low oxygen conditions, um, but yet they thrive and they're beautiful. And here they are. So we have a dead bamboo whip coral that looks like it's also at least a meter or so tall that's fallen, right? It's a former bamboo coral that's got some hydroids on it. And you can see all these stumps around it. And so I'm beginning to wonder if these stumps are mostly these bamboo whips that we um, got a good glimpse of earlier. Right? You can see that. it's pretty pretty clear. I'm gonna go around this ledge and see what we get. We got a shrimp and a crinoid of course and lots and lots of little ophoroids and other echinoderms which are a family with, with starfish and urchins and uh, sea biscuits, sand dollars, whoa! Eel. Eel. Hello, eel. Just passing through. If you missed it, we saw a hagfish yesterday, which was quite a surprise. <laughs> yeah, just a little deeper than this, actually. So it's not. It wouldn't be a surprise if we saw another one, um, given that these sea mounts are so, or not sea mounts, these places are so close to each other. One sea mount, one island. Did you see a whole truckload of hagfish dumped down on the highway? Oh, no, but I can only imagine the mucus stream that would have caused. Hagfish are extremely mucusy. Um, to call it a mild sneeze would be like the understatement of the year. When, they, when a hagfish feels threatened, it can produce an absolute ton of mucus in seconds, really. It's super fast. Um, we're taking a look at this wall. Anything that jumps out at you, Alexis? I see, I see a lot of stumps going on, and of course we've got... Uh, is that a, what is that yellow one again? Is it the same? It's the same prayer Mercia? Yeah. Yeah, oh it is, absolutely. Sorry, I just had a weird view of it. We're looking straight on. And it looks like there might be a, another recruit of the same prayer to the left. Yep. Yep. 
and uh, we've definitely got a lot of stumps. So at one point, this was fully inhabited with something else. I want to take a look at that white coral right up there. Is it okay with you? Yeah, look at that. Let's take a look. Let's see. Whoa. All right, sorry, driving lessons. I'm only driving the camera, don't worry. They won't let me actually drive the sub, which is a great thing. <laughs> I would never want that responsibility. All right, here we go. I'm trying to get a nice little even set on this. There we go. So, oh, this is, this is different. What have we here? Alexis whining. I'm looking, hold on. It's hard because I can't really get a solid. Yeah, it's a it. Looks like a sclerotinian to a hard coral, an elopsomia maybe? Maybe, it doesn't quite look as, as regularly branched. Ooh, ooh, my fault. <sighs> as I would have. Expected? Yep, that's what I'm doing. I'm in the same. Sorry, I'm making everyone seasick. <laughs> All right, let's see. Analipsomia is our best guess right now, but it I, that has usually is a little bit more of a regular branching pattern to this, and this one looks a little bit less so. I think when it is to correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the characters of anal analipsomia is that it only has polyps on one side of the skeleton. Is that true? They yeah. face one way. So let's see what this looks like. That's what we're looking for, everyone. Do the polyps face just one way? Okay. Thank you, pilots, for saving me from myself. <laughs> yep. Okay, we were about to find out. Hold your breath. And... I don't know. It's such a weird angle. I maybe. Yes. It looks like they're all kind of coming towards the screen and they're not on the back side of this, which would make it an analipsomia. What do you think this is? I'm not sure. We have Eric entering the room because we finally found something uh, kind of strange. I it, it looks it looks like all the polyps are coming towards the screen rather than behind. Kind of, except the ones down on the bottom there. That's what we were uh. in the library. I'm not so sure. There's also Selenosimelia that looks a lot like this. So, Steve thinks it looks like an Alipsomia too. He says it's definitely a Scleractinian. Do you want to take a water sample here? Yeah, I'd also like to have a, a piece of it. I was thinking about that. Is that going to be super brittle? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's like the lophelia. Yep. Yeah. Just like it. Yeah. It's Just like, like it. Very similar. <laughs> the coral cutters will work, and you can use the gripper part of it. It'll just, but when you get the blade close to it, it'll snap. That's fine. The rubber's there to catch it. Rubber's there to catch it. Yeah, you don't even have to close the blade. You can almost put a tube through. Branches. Let's take the left. No. Trying to grab it if it falls. Let's let Eric decide because these will break much differently. Okay. I mean, it's pretty steep here, so it looks like you can get the tube underneath. Yeah, no, I think that's. I don't want to do that. Well, no, not drive it that way, but just when you just go for the grab, just have it underneath. So if it falls, you know what I mean. Yeah, you're saying, but the problem is I'm I'm down a camera, so I'm flying slightly different angle now. So yeah. Well, it's over. It's over the basket. Alright, Deputy. Well, I'm inverted. Do you want to just see the joke? Even though it's like a little beer. It is funky. 
It could be a knob, Sam. I'm, yeah. What's, sorry, I'm just not sure. I mean, it's even sneaks over here, so you might be able to get under the overhang there. Alright, it sounds like we're setting up the sample here and can you can you zoom out? Uh me? Oh, yeah, can yeah. I yeah. Oh, can I swap out with you real yes. quick? I'll get it and rest. Above it or below it? Oop, oh, you're above it. You just want it. They want to be able to see the manipulator itself, and some of the pilots need to see more of the arm to really know where it is. Um, and you obviously need to see like as kind of as close as you can in the sample and the manipulator, so you can see where to put the jaws. Yep. Maybe not that far. Oh yeah, you can see from the same call that it is all on one side. Sort of. Yeah, it probably is an Alps yeah, it just looked different yeah. than the other ones. Either way we haven't sampled it yet. Yeah. And it could be there could be more than one species too. I don't know. Should we see?
the biggest thing is just moving everything very, very, very slow. Whatever. Five or six. Five or six. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to put this? Yeah, you might as well. You can cork six and leave five. Did you take the notes on that or you want me to take that? I think I got it. Thank you. I'm very grateful to Eric for coming in there. Um, the camera controls when the ROV pilots are sampling is a bit of a delicate art that I am still learning. And so it's really great to have a guide through that process. Uh, there are nine people in the room all contributing to this effort. And so it is really awesome to see.
probably wasn't going to go anywhere. Nice. Look at that. Perfect. Okay, I have one more request before we leave this area. Yep. Might as well just Lasers on base. Open if we're gonna Lasers on base, please. Lasers on okay, we're going to leave six open. Small stopper, and we might as well leave six open. We can use it again. Yep. Instead of big stopper, right there. Perfect. Oh, great. No. So we can get a pretty good estimate of that. That looks like it's almost four to five centimeters in yeah. diameter. I think it's thanks a lot. That's really helpful. Great. So with these lasers in the same plane as the base of the coral, we'll be able to get an accurate measurement later, which will give us some indication of size. Thanks. Pilots, that was an awesome collection. Really appreciate it. So we have determined that like elapsam uh, analapsamia, uh, the polyps really were all sort of focused to one side, but it had a branching pattern that was really uncharacteristic of the other analapsamias that we've seen in the area, for example, on the Winslow Reef and other parts of the Phoenix Islands with the Okeanos crews. And so we took this sample. Can we just see if this is what we thought? No, probably not. Um, no, I don't think it is. Okay. Um, we were... So we think this may be a different species, and so we're really keen to have a closer look in the lab in a couple hours, or more like 12, <laughs> or however long this dive is going to last. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to continue to fly. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. All right. I think we turned off a light in there. I don't know if we could turn it back on. It might be wrong. Oh, there it is. All right, continuing our exploration here. Look at this neat little disruption in the lava flow. And there's another Aritagordia to the left, Squiddlers, which we're not going to take a close look at given the slope, but we'll stop at our next one. Some more Norellids, which are really these sort of branched fan corals that we see. I'm going to kind of keep going here. And we're on some pretty interesting terrain. You can really see um, how there are these subtle changes in the rock features. I'm not a geologist, so I, I, I'm scared to even conjecture some guesses. But oop, we have another stalked crinoid there. A couple of them. They seem to be really set up next to these norellids really closely. You see that? Most every time you see one, you see another. Uh, it seems to be a pretty persistent pattern, so I'll just note that association. But um, I really like the subtle changes in the morphology because it gives us a lot of opportunity to see different critters as they are using the topography differently. So we have these very unusual, highly branched stalked crinoids next to the sort of benthically associated crinoids next to norellids, and they seem to be all liking the same habitat. So I will make a note of that here that we've got all that going on. Okay, continue to fly. We are on Te Terina Seamount, which means a sister, right? And it is the sister seamount right next to Rawake Island, which is where we were diving yesterday. We are in the remote and uninhabited portion of the Phoenix Islands protected area, which is one of the very largest marine protected areas on this planet. It is the world's largest and deepest World Heritage Site. Let's take a look at this, if that's okay. 
It looks like a, an, an, an analipsamia that's sort of broken, and I see two bases right on top of each other. I'd kind of like to take a look at both. Yeah, but you see there's two bases on them. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're guessing that this thing is a little too heavy and fell down. Okay, that's really great. Thanks, guys. And I um, I want to take a look. It looked like there was a living one up in the top of that, too. So we're going to... Ooh, let's see if I can... Yeah, perfect. Here's an Arelid again. These bases are interesting because it looks almost like they took a piece of rock with them when they fell, the crust. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so they okay. got too heavy and they tumbled, the rock itself tumbled because these rocks don't seem to be secured. All okay, the got it. So, as is often the case, we see one interaction and then we have to guess how it happened. And the working system here is that these corals, look at how big they are, got so heavy that they pulled up the crust or the rock and tumbled down this hill, which is a pretty steep slope. We are sitting, unfortunately. Just a, I was just about to say this. It's a good opportunity. We're going to sample this now. Yep. Can we sample this Norella while we're here? Yep, sure. Great. So we're going to set up for another collection because we don't have this species of Norella yet. And it's very common in this area. And... I think we just need maybe one or two big branches. One would be sufficient, Bob. One, but you can take it pretty close to the base so we get a ni one nice big long one. I think so, yep. I can't quite tell how big it is. Is that really long? Pretty long, yeah. Or maybe halfway through then? Just enough to fit, we want it to fit in a quiver. So, you got it. All right. Randy Sampling School, please tell me what you need because I don't know. Um, I can't move to the right. I don't have any more more scan ability. Yep, really. I I I really I have no left right ability or up down. I got nothing. China. Yes, thank you, Darren. To devices, so just for clicking, call that one science box. So it's the back. Maybe just below that, um, this really interesting kind of feature. Do you want me to zoom in tighter? Yeah, that's great. That's that's a good amount for us, but not too much. That's perfect, perfect, perfect. Nicely done. So now I'm gonna zoom out for you and tell me where you want me to be. Okay, following you in.
Zoom in, yep. Ooh. Are you trying to get to three or one? Or two or what? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Nice. Nice job, guys. That was awesome. I think I'm forever spoiled with how good you guys are. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> so we have a putative, putative ID on this coral, which might be Norella macrocalyx, which has some of the largest polyps in the genus, according to Steve Auskovich, who is our shoreside support from Temple University. But we will find out in a couple hours in the lab. Thank you so much, guys. That was awesome. So as soon as you're ready, there was, um, right above these two dead bases, there was another coral on the top that we wanted to kind of get a little look at that might have been the same thing as what toppled down. Did you see what Steve also sent about your lymphocytes? I know that, yeah. Oh, okay. I, uh, we, there's been an e email conversation about that going on. The one just above, the white star people should be. Nope, above that. Above it? Mm hmm. Behind it. Or behind it, sorry. I'm not sure. But it, we saw it when we first were descending down. I, I, I could be mistaken, but I think there's something like in oh, this region. Yeah, oh, right over there, okay. Yeah, and that's what I'm looking for. Big box, it's got a little floaty hole in it. You got one? Oh, big one, yeah. The, the big one? Yeah, you see there's the stalks like sticking out of it. It's very floaty. Oh yeah, I'm either remember we've sold ours from now, but that stuff needs to get inside. Yes, that's right.
So it's this, that I think it's up here. See this white coral that's kind of coming into vague relief? That's kind of what I wanted to... Or maybe it's this one, but there was something that looked reminiscent of what these two stalks might have been, and that's kind of what I wanted to get a handle on. So you see these big toppled bases of corals with a bit of crust on the base of them. You know, I'm almost tempted to pick one up while we're here. Just so we can get a clue. We've already put everything away, huh? We can get it back up. What do you need? I was sort of tempted just to collect this base. But uh, let's not. Sorry. You know what? Let's. I'm sorry. We're not going to have this chance again. Thank you. So we're going to set up for one more collection. Which one is it? And then I promise we'll move on. What are you thinking of collecting? I want to collect this big base and take a look at it. It's got some crust on the bottom. It's an interesting opportunity to look at the base. You know how big it is? It's huge. Um, Where's it going to go? Uh, in one of the bio box sections? Okay. No? If you think it's a mistake, tell me now. No, no, I think lasers on it. It looks huge. We don't have to take it. Whoa, it's too much. It's too much. Yeah, yeah. We don't have to take it. I was settled. Oh, damn it. The fight was still too much. No, no, no. It gets pretty steep in here. You know what? Let's skip it. It looks really big and it's steep. No, really. Yeah, this was. So where do you want to go now? We're going to go up. We're just going to kind of follow our track. And I didn't get a look, glimpse of what's behind. And that's great. But I, I don't want to, if it's steep, I definitely don't want to make you guys topple here. Cool. So we're making little moves. Just a little bit of time, yeah. And then you're going to help All right. Thank you. I'm sorry to change my mind. Really? You're not mad. <laughs> okay. Let's fly. <laughs> My only request is we're flying is as I said I think I thought when we sat down that there was something big here. There is a white coral up in front of you. Yeah, there should be two of them. The one on the left looked kind of um an ish again and the one on the right was I couldn't get a good glimpse at it. Hey, we got Tim Shank joining us. Tim and Randy Show. Yeah. Oh yeah. That sounds great. So what did, what's been happening? What have you been seeing? So um, let me fill you in a little. We've had some pretty consistent habitat with norelids that seem to be almost always adjacent or very close by to these really stocked branched crinoids that we saw in the very beginning. A lot of sort of benthic crinoids as well. Really varied, highly rugose um, substrate, which has been nice. We have sampled um, a strange looking analipsamia, we think. And um, we just sampled a norelid. Uh, to confirm it because it looks a little unusual. We don't have one of those yet. And now I'm hoping just before I leave, I'm going to see if I can get a. Yeah, I, that, I want to. That looks more like a classic analipsamia to me. What do you think? Um, oh, is that a corallid? No. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to take it. We're going to take a close look at this too. It looks like it's a different coral. I think it looks like an analipsamia. Yeah, you're right. It is. Clockwise is clockwise down. Sorry. I get it. I want a magic aura, so that's why. Oh, I see. Uh, We've got wishful <laughs> thinking going on. All right, we're good. It's an analipsamia. And we're going to, I just, I thought I saw another big one. That Maybe that's it to the right. 
So if we could just take a look at this ridge here, guys. That would be awesome. And then I will leave you to it, Tim. Yeah, so we're just taking a look. I think there was another one up on this ridge. I just want to kind of get a sense if this is if this is an Alipsamia habitat and what that might look like. If there's only one, then I stand mistaken, but I, I could have sworn I saw a couple. So I could be blind. You know, it's been very, uh, it's been hard to look at. I don't see another one, do you? Uh, we were looking at that little white coral. There's another one, maybe. We also saw a cup curl, coral nope. earlier. We're just going to take a scan of this ridge. So how do you want to collect out? Okay. I think we're good. I think we're ready to keep flying on track. I'm going to turn you over to Tim. Go back to the waypoint. Um, so I think I'm going to let Tim make that call. Do you want to go back to the waypoint? Or you want to continue? You want to kind of head back towards it? What's, okay, I'm sorry. What, what, we're what, trying to decide whether we should head back to the, the yeah, it's, it's yellow, I think, right? That's where we're headed? Yeah. What's the white waypoint? Well, that's, that's the ship's, ship's waypoint. Ship. So the ship's heading here, and we should kind of head deck down to waypoint three. And okay. kind of get back on track. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to go back to our waypoint and get a little back on track. But maybe if we can kind of stick to the left of that so we, that looks more like sand to me, sort of stay on the rock and stuff. So the first one was at about 1,500 meters. The second one was not long after that. I would say yeah, we're exactly. going up to about 900, so I wouldn't collect Thanks. another one until we're All right. closer, yeah. I don't think, I think we have two. Um, so this is the, and then the, the Lula in it, so it's like really, yeah, okay. Um, we have an Arella that's closed. This has a small stopper in it, so you can put another sample there. And then eight is yeah. All right, I'm going to zoom out here and turn you over to the very capable hands of Tim Shink from Woodhole Oceanographic Institution while I go eat whatever delicious sounds like it's not for lunch. Uh, spare ribs. Oh, so good. So good. Really good. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, good morning. How are you? Yeah, I think so too. Because we're going to end up coming down further right, to the next waypoint. And then we'll do this. So, Uh, hello, this is Tim Shank. I'm from the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and um, deep sea uh, biologist. And uh, I'm sitting in the watch leader station here. And you can hear some commotion in the control room. It's just that we're uh, having a switchover of, uh, of watches right now. So. And uh, getting our bearings. We're going to be uh, traveling almost due south uh, to, hit, to link up with our uh, third waypoint uh, of this dive. I think there are a total of seven as we proceed up the side of this uh, seamount. We always have to exchange information when we trade out uh, watches, uh, convey what we've been seeing, what we've been doing, uh, get a current status on what's happening and what the next objectives are. So it always uh, takes a few minutes.
might want to get down there soon. Uh, no, I just got <laughs> I filled up on that rice. Oh, you did? Oh, okay, good. All right. All right. <laughs> so is there no overlay today? Oh, okay. There's no overlay today? Um, right, so Got it. Okay. All right. So we're currently at 1,471 meters depth. 1,470. And uh, again, we're headed almost due south. We're a bit, bit, a bit high off the bottom, but this is a, a particularly a rocky area. Uh, what looks like on echelon pits. Uh, we come up and over one and go back down into another one, looks like to me. <clears throat> and on the margins of some of these overhangs, <coughs> seeing anemones and maybe a hyd hydroids, um, a few hard co uh, corals. We, apparently, just one was uh, collected uh, a few minutes ago. What's that? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Coming down a little bit. What do you think? Waypoint's only about 50, uh, 50 meters away. Okay, <clears throat> so our goal today is to um, assess the uh, diversity of corals uh, and associates, as are animals are living in association with the corals. Um, as we traverse up the seamount, we'll uh, collect samples of things that are representative and both things that are we haven't seen before. Um, seeing a few crinoids here on the seafloor attached to the rock. Um, How deep do you want to go? For? That's good. I was just trying to get to a point where I could sort of be, see better on the seafloor better. Just to be closer. So. All right, Chris, can we come up and look a little bit more and look at those? We're seeing quite a few hard corals. They're kind of sparse, but um, saw the Nalop Samia variety and saw another one that was a little, had a branching pattern that wasn't quite like an Nalop Samia, that are usually all uh, polyps are directed in, in one particular direction. Uh, 
Okay. No, it's okay. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with this depth. I just want to be able to, just to be a little bit closer to the seafloor. A lot of these things, it's hard to it's hard to see them against the dark background. Still getting situated here. for the basic morphology coming off, off, off the seafloor. So this is what we've been seeing a lot of today, right? Sorry. I'm trying to drive things with the camera. I shouldn't be doing that. A bit of a, a, bit of a focus issue today. Let's see. Okay, we've seen that. We see on the bunch. We we can keep moving here, Chris. Okay. Thanks. See much in the way of associates yet today. <clears throat> but we'll keep an eye out. <clears throat> wow, this is really becoming difficult. Hey, well, Chris, can you turn more into the wall and yeah. grab a little bit more, I think? It's just falling away so much, it's hard to keep any light on the seafloor. You guys have much of a current today? You feeling something? Uh, 0.7, I think. Yeah? On the surface, so. Mm -hmm. uh, we're about 20 meters from waypoint 2. Uh, 3, sorry, waypoint 3. better look here at the face of this uh, slope. It's a pretty dramatic slope. In some ways it almost looks uh, completely vertical. There we go. Another purple sea cucumber, left side of the screen. Seen quite a few of those today, but mostly been amongst the rocks all day today. Just uh, pockets of sediment. See it draping down on this, on this feature. We're just turning now to come more pointed to the east. Our next waypoint. Uh, I would keep following this. It should should lead us in that general direction. A little bit more oh, east yeah. and south. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's stick with it. Yeah. We'll see if it <coughs> takes us there. Oh, I don't have a 
uh, yeah. waste time. So right now there's a just discussion in the uh, control room here about uh, how to position the ship relative to the ROV. We're always watching that out for that as we uh, come up slope. Yeah, sure, no, please. Yeah. So uh, we want to make sure there's a, there's a, a, what, down below? Where? On the, to the left. Right now the ROV is sort of holding position here while we have this discussion about how to maneuver the, the ship. I think we may see a coral here to the left. I see the. Oh, you mean the the white one? White to the left of the crime. Here, up there. There's a couple of them up here. Looks like. You see that up, Sammy, up, up above us. Wow, this focus is off today. Okay, coming back. Be nice to see Majapura, another type of hard coral that we expect might be in this area. And, and uh, don't believe that's what that is that we're seeing down on the seafloor. So. Is it all, all those pops pointing in one direction? Is often an in indicator of uh, Nalop Samia. And you'll see the Majapur has a real uh, zigzag pattern to its branching. It's hard to see here in this planar view. I don't. Uh, think that's an Alp Samia? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chris. That's good. Can we move now? Or yeah. No. Yep. No, All them. And yeah, we're still <clears throat> still holding in this general location. You see something up here? Yeah. Let's see what that little stalk is up there. Quite a few now of Samia. That's just a sponge stock. There. Um, sea star, there's a plexard yellow coral there with a brittle star in it. Yeah, more now of Samia hard corals. There's some small white brittle stars on this uh, iron manganese crust. It rises up out of the sediments. There's another uh, primnoid coral way off to the left. We've seen that today already. This is a nice uh, stalk of some sort. We'll just sit here for a second. Straight in front of you, Chris, I thought I saw some uh, tall stalk things um, that we call a Rinogorgia. They spiral or they wave. They're there. 
I think so. I think that's them right there. There'll be a whirl at the top. I'll try to come up with my camera. There's like right there. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. We're gonna cry over there on the left, on the right, and we're gonna have a looks to be a rid of Gorgia. We often, uh, first thing I look for is the axis and whether it's actually wavy or whether it spirals up. So it looks like it has actual more of a waviness to it, which uh, to me would be uh, Rodan and Ritagorgia. This, this is taller than what we've seen so far, um, I think on this, on this cruise in the last uh, three dives. I don't see any associates, but we'll uh, take a look. Looks like you're pretty square up here. Sometimes we often have uh, crabs that live on the staircase here, uh, uh, different whorls um, of this coral. Oftentimes we'll have a, a shrimp species or two that we find in there as well. And you can see this uh, coral certainly landed on a promontory here, a little, little uh, micro ridge here for uh, Attachment and that's now waving in the current. That's okay. That's good. Thanks, Chris. Could we continue on? Continue on? Yeah, sure. We've seen we've seen these before. Uh, even on this dive, just a lot, uh, not quite as tall as that one. We keep uh, moving up slope. We're now at 1455 meters. It's really not easy with uh, being on such a steep wall like this to operate uh, the ROV in a way that we can look out um, to our right as we, as we sort of crab along and keep our eyes. As we're, we're pointed to the northeast with the vehicle, you're at your view right now, but we're sort of moving toward more toward the east. And uh, we're ever wary of uh, overhangs and things like that. Yesterday we came up un under two overhangs and toward the end of our dive that were really uh, spectacular in one sense, but uh, not so for the, the ROV group. We are tethered there. See, there's something on this one. Oh, that's what I want to see. So can we look at this? Oh. Is that Medusa? Yeah. That's what I want to see. I think it is. No, it's still attached. Nope. Yes. Down it goes. Maybe it, maybe it left. Tim? Yeah. So you want to... I don't know it's hard. It's hard to tell. These are the the um, I find that to be a little more wavy than than <coughs> than spirally. Yeah. It's only got a whirl or two on the top. It's hard. To, it's hard to say. I don't know what you. What do you think? They are highly spaced worlds. It does look like Magnus. Browns. It does, like Mag it does. I agree. It could be Magnus, a different species of uh, of a Gorgia there. And I feel like what we saw earlier. 
can always go back. But one thing that caught our eye on when looking at this, when we came up to it, we had this sort of purple uh, ovoid shaped object. And um, we've seen this quite a bit on this cruise. In fact, we had an Arita Gorgia like this that had four of the, these um, ovoid bodies on it. It's a Narco Medusa. It's a jellyfish, basically. Sort of. It's a, uh, called Sigwood Widelia. It's a mouthful, but um, it seemed to be uh, predating on these corals. That's okay. We can, we can take off, Chris. That's good. We got it. That uh, Medusa took off and left. But they attached themselves uh, to the coral. Um, and again, we've seen these before, um, sort, of, sort of rarely. Uh, but uh, on this cruise, we're seeing them more and more, especially in association with the Rita Gorgia for some reason. If you see something on your monitor, let me know back there, guys. Now they're a crinoid. Back off a little bit, maybe, and see. Get more room here. There we go. You see these ophiroids on the bottom? Is uh. On the Yeah, it's just in a couple now. It's one of these reddish brown ones. And, uh, I, I think they might be crinoids. I could, well, I just saw one I felt like it was not, so I don't know. Yeah, I saw one. You got it back there? You see it? Yeah, I saw one that looks like it was too. I was a. Oh. They have very thin arms. Yeah. I think they're mostly crinoids on the bottom. We see these uh, yellow and maroon ones, but. Okay. Just seeing a crinoid going down slope. Part of our thrust wash. That's uh, what you're seeing in the water column. It's a product of us thrust, thrusting in the water. Pick up a lot of these loose sediment. Pulling it off the rocks. Well, it's mostly out to our right now, I think. Looking at the sonar screen here. Some very light particles, so. This is the uh, 70th dive, 71st dive of the ROV Sebastian. Um, maybe it's third or fourth cruise, I think. We hope to get in 16 or 18 dives. This is dive number four of our program. 
And our third seamount or island that we've been diving on. The goal of understanding uh, how diversity of life changes in the deep ocean on seamounts in the Phoenix Islands region, looking at biodiversity of corals uh, and, and their associates, animals that live on them. Um, so our goal is to cover a certain amount of ground over depth. So we start at a certain depth uh, looking at slope features that are high in relief, 30, 40, 50 degree slope areas, um, because those areas are typically de um, devoid of sediment and uh, we see hard bottom in those places and that's what the kind of habitats that we see, the sessile fauna that are corals and sponges like a lot. Uh, and then those corals act as a, a framework or a ecosystem engineers, if you will, that allow um, other animals to colonize them. They serve as habitat for um, a lot of animals, probably more than 3,000 species now have been described um, or soon to be described on deep water corals. And um, trying to understand the nature of that interaction, how it, um, we, we've over the last uh, decade or so, we've looked at patterns of how these associations occur. We know that certain uh, corals have a, a typically host to certain species of brittle star ophiroid or certain species of, of, of uh, galatheid or chylostyle crab or um, a, a variety of different species. But then we also see that when the corals uh, lose their tissue, if part of the tissue has been abraded by something or a, pred a predators come along and taken tissue off of a coral, branch that other colonizers will, will then come in, such as uh, hydroids and uh, barnacles um, and, and crinoids, those kind of things. And there's a, there's, a, there's a real interaction, even when the corals die, that provide habitat. But the interactions we really want to see um, uh, and understand are the ones where these, these associations, where the, how the, the brittle star finds the coral, how it knows how to um, locate a coral and and also um, how these crabs seem to find these corals that are separated by kilometers sometimes of distance. So whether it's dispersal they do it, whether they do it through chemical sensing, whether they do it in some way um, uh, with using fluorescence or, or bioluminescence or something, um, how they communicate. And, they, and they, it seems to me that they may communicate uh, through contact and um, whether that means that they are uh, giving off uh, chemical enzymes, things that are, that are properties that allow them to communicate uh, cell to cell, uh, organism to organism, and that kind of thing. But it's clear that, that the, the e ecology, the development and growth of animals that live on corals have come in tight association with, with the corals. Some, we see some that, only, that must or obligate must live on these, these species of corals. Uh, we just don't understand mechanistically how it happens. And that's uh, here we are in the Phoenix Islands, unexplored areas, taking the patterns that we understand that we've seen over the last years and applying to what we see here. And, um, and so we continuously will stop and zoom and, and with the camera systems and look at the corals and try to see who's living on them, how they're positioned. Um, we will look at, and for example, how crinoids will attach to a coral um, through their cirri, the little legs on the back, the, the sort of graspers. Uh, talons, if you will, for, for the crinoids, and they grab onto the coral and they abrade the coral. The coral tissue gets uh, disrupted, uh, and um, with time, the, the coral can overgrow the the cirri of the of the um, crinoid and actually hold it down, and then the crinoids has to respond. So there, there's a constant interaction. These uh, associates seem to have find a home there. They find uh, protection from predators. Uh, they may protect the corals. Uh, we've seen certainly in the Gulf of Mexico, following the oil spill, that those places where the brittle stars were attached, um, that the polyps underneath the, uh, the brittle stars um, survived much better than those that were fully exposed um, to the, the products of the oil, the oil spill. So we know there's a benefit that uh, that these uh, associates uh, bring to the uh, to the host coral. So I think uh, Randy Rochin's back. I think she's going to take over for a while as we head on to, uh, to waypoint four. As we traverse along the slopes and walls here. There's a couple of uh, crinoids here. I think we've seen those already today. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. 
So we just came a little south to catch the waypoint. I think when you left last is where we were. And um, heading over to the east a little bit. You want to keep going for uh, I can. <laughs> Bless you. Yeah, one thing I could do, I can come back. I have one thing I would need to do, but I can come back. I want to get something off before. Okay. All right. I got it. I know. So, that's what I've got. But mine was like October 1st. But anyway, so it's fine. No, okay. So, is that a Talagorgia right there? Oh, just in time. You know me. Yeah, I know. With, with, with a crinoid, actually. So that's, maybe we're going to get into the Metallogorgia field here. Metallogorgia Forest? Yeah, it's 1462 meters depth. So uh, just make a note of that. I've had a couple of those, yeah. So I'm picking my time off of right here, GMT time. Yeah. 2342. Depth is 1465. Uh, yes. So with the line that we're showing, we're following track of this way. Yes, point. right. Okay for us to keep going up here and, you know. I think that's fine. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, we may have to, um, right, so this feature takes off maybe more toward the east than we want to go on our track line. So I think we can, if we can keep in touch with the bottom and still tr go for our waypoint. Is that okay? You have to move the ship oh, down so further, right? Yeah, no, that, that's fine. It's just yeah. if, if we start going more. Yeah. Let's let's keep coming down the line then, okay? And just keep in touch with the bottom. Does that make sense to you? So we're gonna. No, I don't know what's going on. Tell me. They've been working on how to. Uh, position the ship relative to where we're yeah, yeah. going mm -hmm. and so um, to make sure they have a bailout plan that something should happen. So I think um, we're going to stay parallel now as we come down the line, see the line there down the next mm -hmm. waypoint. And so I'm told them to keep in touch with this feature that we're looking at as we come down that line and then bring the ship down further. That's all. It just takes a little bit of, it always happens sort of after a couple hours they want to look at the ship's position and how the train is looking and Look at the map and sort of reassess. So there's a there's a bailout. They don't want to get caught. No, they tend to be caught, you know, yeah. with something a uh, big feature above us. Uh, so are they on a? So they are. So I don't need to weigh in here. They have, you guys have just. Oh no no, no they got it. I mean okay. yeah yeah we're gonna go to waypoint one I think and not Great. not go off to the. It's my favorite east. way to drive. Science only. Yeah, because I think that that waypoint leads us up to where we want to go to be when we get toward the top. Any collection projects anyway. or anything? Or are we just kind of exploring right now? Exploring. All right. Do what you do. Yeah. I do what I do. You were doing that really well earlier today. I thought. Yeah, you see that by terrible zooms, yeah. though. It just the zoom. It, the camera really is sensitive to zoom, so you just have to. Okay. I, I think I find letting the say, yeah. you know, let let the pilot yeah, do that kind of thing. And, fair enough. All right. I I will I do what I do. All right, I'll be back. Okay. Keep doing. I'm doing. You got it. Kind of go straight. Tom, it's always you can't. You know. Yeah. Somebody's got to come. Uh, Get me out of the hot seat first, but yeah. I'll, so I'll see what he needs. All right, yeah. that's fine. So, I'm going to grab it. Thank you. Good job, Randy. Good job, Tim. Go, team. I don't know. All right. So, as you guys probably just heard, we have a little shift in personnel here. You just lost Tim, who's the real expert. Now you're stuck with me. But for better or for worse, I am Randy Rogen. I'm from Boston University. and I'm delighted to be here with you on the seafloor of Te Terina Seamount in the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. This is an uninhabited, um, uninhabited region of one of the largest marine protected areas on the planet and one of the largest and deepest UNESCO World Heritage Sites. This uh, particular place is fully protected from all human activities and extractive activities, so no commercial fishing, no mining, no dredging, no nothing and it's really reflected on the seafloor i think one thing to point out is so far with all the dives from the okeanos there were eight and we are on dive five here the only time we've seen any evidence of humanity 
and human debris on the seafloor has been um, off of Canton Island, which is the only one that is inhabited. So we really are in a pretty, um, yeah. I just don't know if this is a rock or a coral, so I was wondering if you have an idea from your screens. It could be a rock coral. Um, and so we are in relatively pristine yeah. areas. I think it's a rock. We're all good. Okay. Um, yeah, we can, go yeah, we can just keep going. Um, and so uh, we're in a relatively pristine area of the ocean. And the goal here from a conservation plant standpoint is to keep it that way and to explore what we have so we, know, we understand what this marine protected area is actually protecting in the depths in its depths. Um, it's worth noting that this is one of the first marine protected areas, actually it was the first ever in 2008 when it was um, implemented to include deep sea and open ocean habitat. And since then the trend has taken off and you, we are living in a time, really unprecedented time for marine conservation where marine protected areas all over the globe are um, being formed and are being formed large enough to include the deep sea and open ocean, but uh, very little of that has been explored. And so we're here in a brand new place that has never been explored before, but that was protected almost 10 years ago. And so it's really exciting to be in a place that um, that is fully protected and has not been explored before and is sort of setting the baseline for trying to understand what marine conservation um, is actually protecting. So here we are exploring the deep sea with all of you on YouTube and Facebook Live and Twitter and Instagram and all the things, um, all the ways you guys are watching us. So thank you for watching us and listening and joining us. This is really awesome to be able to do this with a global audience. We've got some sea star action right here. Let's take a little look at that so we can log it. Yep. Do we have me? No, he's eating. <laughs> I just want to take a quick look at that sea star. It looks similar to one we saw before, but it'd be good just to get a... Ready? Thanks. Is that a hymenaster? I think so. I think what Deb is trying to tell me from across the room that if, is if, that if you have any questions on YouTube, you can type them in um, on the YouTube live channel chat feed thing, technical term or Facebook, and Deb, who is our marine tech on duty, will tell us about it, and we will do our best to answer all of your questions. So please don't be shy. We're here um, exploring this. We're doing science and documenting what we find, um, and we have doing setting up for some collections and trying all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to get a zoom here because this is a really good image. Um, I don't know. Is that a hymenaster? It's got some unusual... Yeah, I think it is. Um, and, uh, but we're also here to answer your questions and explore together because this is really a, a massive effort by a lot of people, including the Schmidt Ocean Institute, of course, the 42 people on this ship, the number of people shoreside, and the U.S. government, NOAA, um, Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and of course the Republic of Kiribati, who um, owns and operates this MPA. And this is a great shot, shrimp, sea star, action in the deep sea. Okay, thanks guys, that was really helpful. So yeah, please send us any questions you've got. I'm gonna. All right, let's see what we see. You're fun to fly with. <laughs> All right, we've got some neat big boulders coming up, which should offer some opportunity to to see some cool corals. I think I see a, is that an anth anthemastis on the top of that boulder? I'm gonna, I wanna take a look right, ooh, right, yeah it is. It's an anthemastis. We're just gonna fly by it, that's okay. That's okay. No, I'm good. It's an squiddler's in the back, we got an anthemastis. Um, it's worth noting in the back that we have Luke McCartan, who is in the Shank Lab at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and Daniel Vogt, who is the Wiss Institute at Harvard and he's a soft robotics engineer playing the role of biologist today with us in the deep sea. Neat little fish. It's a halosaur. Luke is also our, um, the fishiest person on board. I say with, oh, there's an Aritagorgia right here on the bottom. I'm gonna take a look at that. Okay, Chris. 
and uh, let's take a look, quick look at that. Um, great, that's what I needed. Thanks, pilots. Enough. That's enough on this one. Looks like it's been chopped up. It does look like it's been chopped up, but or it could just be a really young one. Um, these are a great coral. Actually, this is this is not straight Erigigorgia. I can't remember what we called it earlier, but we identified it as um, Rodan. Roya Rodan Erigigorgia. Thank you, um, because it's got wavy, you know, wavy, a wavy stalk instead of a spiral, a true spiral, <coughs> like Magnus spiralis, which is um, I think my I'm still logging that as my favorite coral in the deep sea so far. Um, it just has a really stunning geography, uh, topography. So Luke, I think you missed it, but we saw a hagfish yesterday. Oh, cool. Um, it was hideous. It was beautifully hideous. I am a mother. <laughs> I have two little kids um, at home watching this at this very minute. So, hi munchkins. Um, I miss you. Usually it's on one of these screens. Where is it? We have 37 screens in this room. So you ask us a simple question like what's the oxygen level and now we have to figure out which of the 37 screens it's on. Okay, so 132.28 but we're unsure right now what that actually is. That can't you possibly be right. I know. Okay, so it may be 132.02 something, but uh, we have to contextualize that. It's certainly not... Yeah, that must be the reading from the... That's a raw value. We have to convert that. So um, we don't know, but in general, it has been rel it's relatively low in the deep seas. So usually... Um, it's like 30-ish. Mm. Yeah, dissolved oxygen content is usually around... Yeah, a little lower than that, I think, usually. Maybe in the mid to twenties. Uh, the temperature is cold, uh, usually in the two to three to four degrees C at these depths. I don't see temperature either. I'm yeah, we to take off our uh, overlay. Uh, we took off our overlay, so that's why I can't find anything. Um, maybe Deb can show you guys a picture of the control room, and you guys could see exactly how many screens we have going on. So this is really incredible um, incredible operation we have going on here as we are going to kind of look is there any way to get a little more um, oops wrong way light going on guys or is that asking too much might be asking too much in these conditions oh yes thank you ready for the control room live everybody control room live Say hi to my kids, yeah. <laughs> hi, Munchkins. <laughs> so I have an almost three-year-old and an almost six-year-old who are <laughs> doing without mommy for a month so that I can explore the deep sea with you. And it's all good. They're very, very patient, sweet Munchkins. We have a lot of family helping out. So thanks to everyone at home. It really does take a village, and in this case, a global one, right, guys? <laughs> it's true. All right, so we have some really interesting landscape here where we're flying by, and I am keeping my eyes out for interesting critters as we go. Um, we could zoom in at any one of these points and see a thousand little things, but we are looking for major ha like um, landscape and habitat changes, trying to get a handle on... Um, what the community ecology is of each particular landscape and we're doing about a, a really long 12-hour um, dive here so that we can try to um, you know I want to take a look at this sort of st structure if it's possible looks like there's a bunch of stuff growing on it um, so we can try to get a good inventory of what lives here in the Phoenix Islands on Te Terina Seamount which means sister to Rewake Island, which is where we were diving yesterday. And we're going to kind of set up a little bit, or at least get, hopefully get a little view of a rock that looks almost like a table, because I see some things growing on it, and we'll take a look and see what they are. Right now, it just, I can't, I, 
I can't even guess, but I see a Metallagorgia in the distance, which is really nice. I love those. But I think we've got two or three corals in this rock, so we'll take a little look at them. But look at the, look at how steep this is. Our pilots deserve a huge amount of credit for navigating terrain like this in the middle of a marine snowstorm. <laughs> wow. And putting up with a really picky biologist going, can we look at this one little coral in the middle of this rock? So thanks guys. We just passed another Analipsamia, which is a Scleractinian with a white skeleton that we saw. And here we have a... Okay, what do we have? Yep. I can't... I think it's a... Um, ooh, thanks guys. Woohoo! All right. Great. This is, this is great. So he... We have a lot going on here. We've got a really interesting anemone that I don't think we've seen before. Uh, so it's a serianthid anemone. A serianthid anemone. They're in their own sort of, uh, sort of family. Which they are, yep. Yeah, so Luke is reporting to me that they are in their own family. That sort of indicates that they're unusual. There you can see that analopsamia below us with a norelid right next door. Um, and we're gonna, Wait until you tell me you're stable, then I'll move in. Right, yep. It's a dance between the pilots, the marine techs, the ship, and me. And I am still learning that dance. So again, I thank everybody for putting up with me. Actually, it's not a serious. Uh... So somebody's asked to see the topos, and I said we want to be in that. Right? Okay, good. It's a really overview. Yep. It's a relic hand that Ooh. Um, which are in there. So we are now revising our ID of this anemone, thanks to Luke McCartan in the back here, who says it's a relicanthid anemone, which is also in its own group, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, and so it's got these really great um, tentacles with sort of these narrow tipped edges, which like to sort of blow in the current. Everything around here is dependent on food drifting down from the surface. And this anemone has made its living by having long tentacles to capture that particle, those particles. And if you take a look at why this rock as opposed to the others, it is nice, tall, columnar, and offers us, see, look, there's three or four analipsamias, five, all in this rock. It's amazing. And a Victor Agorgia too, I think. Um, that, and this one is less sedimented than the other, so it's got a really nice um, shape for attracting corals too and in enemies and sponges and whatever else is living on it to hang there. Guys, my slack isn't working, so if somebody who comes up, let me know. Okay, good job. Going down slowly. Yeah, there's something living in that coral. I think it is metallogorgia. Okay. We have, um, yeah, there's definitely metallogorgias. Yep, same guy. We, um, we have a slack channel open with some of our shoreside collaborators, including Steve Askovich from Temple University and Dave Gruber from CUNY Brook. Um, and if there's any of our other expert collaborator friends listening who are desperate to jump in on the ID action, let us know. We can, uh, we can become slackers with us. Oh, nice set. So these pilots are amazing. You see what they are? They are definitely got the e-brake on on this uh, very steep slope. All right. All right. So I'm going to zoom in. Okay. I'm going to try to get to this rock in the background here. Oof. Ooh. Again, who let me drive? There's that beautiful anemone. Which, what, do, what do we think it's called again, Luke? It's a relicanthid. A relicanthid, yep. And what kind of corals do we have here with the oafs? Let's see, there's three or four of them. I got a quick look. They're yellow. They look like they could be the... Uh, I don't know. I can't quite see them. This is a... There's a lot of, a lot of snow. Did you get a good look at it, Luke? I definitely did not. Um, it's definitely not an analopsamia. It might be a no, it's the yellow. Um, At the bottom. 
Uh, uh, no, the it's yellow fan, ophroid in the middle. Yeah, it is a plexoid, but I can't. I'm struggling to remember the name of it. Thank you, paramaricia that we've been. Yep, I've been seeing over and over again. I think I think um, this is a challenging spot. So let's go left instead and take a look at the metallogorgia that's in the top, and then we'll keep flying. That's all right. Nah, it's good. So here we go. We've got um, what's looking like. Yep, definitely. The uh, metallogorgia and the relid, some crinoids on it. Uh, yep, I see that too. Awesome. So we are going to see, this is, actually let's just spend one more second here before we go flying because this is a perfect demonstration of why corals live here. This is all of this snow, marine snow coming down off the slope is exactly why these corals want to live exactly here. This is food raining down into their mouths. And for the same reason that it's making us hard to take a really good set and see, it's delivery, it is literally a food delivery supply system, a highway straight to them. So this is a great example of that. Okay, thanks pilots, I think we're ready to fly. So we're always walking this line between steep terrain that is great for corals to sit on and steep terrain that is really challenging to work on. So this is part of the joy and challenge of working in these kinds of environments. But corals like to live in tough places, as do we. Sorry, thanks for taking controls. Um, everyone in this room has learned that I should never be trusted with Zoom. <laughs> and I'm grateful for the help. Just tell me what you want me to do if you want me to do something. Thank you. I'm still learning how to fly, everyone, very publicly. So we are getting repositioned here, and while we're doing that, um, you can see these lasers right in front of us. They are 10 centimeters apart, and they're really helpful for helping to size up various critters. So for example, we've got, well, we've got an analipsamia in front of us that's um, the lasers are not in the same field of view, so they have to be lined up in the same plane. But if we, if they were, we would be able to guess about how big it, things are. And that's really helpful when we come up with critters and we're trying to get a handle on um, their age, their size, how big of a sample we need, etc. And the biggest thing we've seen so far today has been a seven meter tall bamboo whip coral, <laughs> which was outrageous. Um, it was bigger than the sub itself. And uh, we had to use the altimeter to size that one because we couldn't do it with the little 10 centimeter lasers alone on a seven meter scale. So this landscape is pretty awesome. We have all this rocky ledge, um, sort of slopey business um, as we come along the sides of these volcanic seamounts, volcanic in origin, that have, get covered over time with these um, ferromanganese crusts. Um, 
and what you see on top is a sediment drape and all of that sediment is coming from surface waters and so the Phoenix Islands Protected Area is really lucky to have several strong collaborators, one of which is um, the Sea Education Association based out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And they come annually and measure the surface water productivity uh, in the summer, every July and August. And they, so they were here just a couple months ago and that's just enough time for some of that surface water productivity to rain down to the bottom. So in the back of my head, I'm always thinking, are we seeing the particles that they saw three months ago finally hitting the seafloor? Just a thought. Sort of, and that's pretty fast moving for particles in the deep sea. Can you put it up on the screen up here, Deb, so I can read it? No. Like that screen? Or the blank. Either. Okay. We are, while well, we're kind of getting set up here with ROV Nav, um, we'll answer some questions from YouTube. Deb's asking me to answer. All right, we are gonna take some questions from YouTube. So the question is, does marine snow change from region to region and what generally makes up the most of marine snow? The answer is yes, it changes from region to region. So different surface currents um, produce different plankton blooms. Um, they have different nutrient regimes. And so all of that is part of the composition of marine snow. In addition, um, we often have uh, sedimentation that can get blown during storms or upwelling events and in different climatic scenarios, so El Nino versus La Nina years, you can get completely different um, temperatures and um, uh, nutrient regimes which can create different uh, planktonic composition. So when we get different plankton community composition, you end up with different things living and then eventually dying and sinking down to the depth. So we definitely get differences in marine snow. Um, Marine snow is generally decomposing organisms that are slowly filtering down um, to the deep sea. They can pass through multiple mouths and also get colonized by microbial biofilms as they fall from the surface to the depths, uh, sometimes picking up nutrients, sometimes losing them. And so you actually have a fairly, you should have a fairly diverse composition of marine snow over the course of a year. Um, but sometimes you, I'm sure there's temporal pulses that are only, mostly com composed of similar critters, especially if you have a large bloom at the surface. All right, great question. Um, is there, if we have any others, I'd be happy to take them. You can post your questions on the live chat on YouTube or on the Facebook live page um, with Schmidt Ocean Institute. And we'll try to answer them. One thing that's really neat about this particular substrate that we're looking at is you can kind of see the change in color composition on the rocks and this is likely a difference in crusting um, overlaying either a basaltic or a calcium carbonate substrate. It's really hard to tell. Um, yeah, but you can really see the m mineralogical differences um, as right, you know, right here featured on the screen. So that's kind of a neat view. All right, we've got some more questions coming in. This one says, how many subs are involved in your setup? I'm used to the Okeanos and Nautilus two sub arrangement. Is that what you're using too? And if not, how do we deal with the ship movement to keep the ROV stable? Okay, I'm gonna give this an attempt, even though I'm not the most technical um, person in the room, but everyone else jump on in if you're like, Luke, come on up here and help, help, help me talk through this. But I, or Daniel, but I think what's happening here is that we have one sub, Sebastian, which is a custom made sub for the RV Falcor. Um, which is the ship owned by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. It's a really large sub, but it is not a two-body system. It um, instead 
has a series of floats, I don't know how many, 10 to 20 floats around, a lot of them on the top, that kind of create a, a suspension uh, float on top of us that creates a little bit of a, a curvature that helps to sort of keep us stable and buffer us a little bit from the surface conditions in the ship. 14 floats, thank you, awesome. And so as the ship moves, we are buffered from the, um, their, the, the subtleties of their movements by this float system. And um, we are a single subsystem. So let's see, is there any more that I can add to that? All right, woohoo. I've passed the technical test, at least for the purposes of uh, answering this question. I hope. Um, we're happy to take more questions if you have them. Again, you can post them to the live chat of YouTube or to the Facebook page. Um, and I can give you a little introduction to our team. So I'm Randy Rogen. I'm a professor at Boston University and the chief scientist of the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. I have a Kiribati counterpart, Torica, from the Fisheries Department. Um, and we um, are really honored to work with this place and sort of uh, run and help shape the science operations from the deep sea to the open ocean to the shallow coral reefs to the terrestrial world and make sure that it liaises well with the Kiribati government who owns and operates this place. Um, I'm joined on this cruise by my awesome deep sea colleagues Tim Schenk from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Eric Cordes from Temple University and we have a cadre of um, awesome students and um, with us who are, have projects of their own and are assisting on sort of all of the group projects that we have going on. And this includes Luke McCartan, who's in the Schenck Lab at Huey, Daniel Vogt, who's at the Wiss Institute at Harvard, Anna Gauthier, who is jointly um, with the, actually with the uh, Children's Hospital and Harvard University in Boston and Boston University. We have Abby and Alexis Weinig from the uh, Cordes Lab at Temple University. I'm just blanking on Abby's last name all of a sudden. Oh. Abby Keller. Keller. Okay, Abby Keller from the Cordes Lab at Temple University. Um, we have Arantes Tekiao from the Kiribati Government Department of Fisheries, who's also a member of the PIPA Scientific Advisory Committee. Who am I missing? We have a lot of people. We have Tom Hoffman, who is our media journalist, filmmaker, blogger, photographer extraordinaire, all things. And, um, we, all together we have a sh ship of 42 people helping to bring you this image from the deep sea, which is amazing. An incredible team of ROV pilots, marine techs, um, and everybody, uh, and the most amazing chefs I could possibly imagine, who are <laughs> just fed us really well. Did you get any lunch? I had the rice, the fried rice, it's great. Oh, so good. Um, I was supposed to lose weight on this trip, but it didn't happen. Nope. <laughs> just too good. Um, and uh, let's see, we have just a, just a number of people on the ship, as I said, 42, not to mention all the people shoreside who have to work to make this happen. Um, the Republic of Kiribati, of course, in a partnership with the U.S. government, um, Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, all of our collaborators, friends, we have members of the scientific community, people like Chris Ma and Bruce Mundy and a number of others, Scott France, a bunch of people who have been commenting and sending emails to us throughout the trip asking us what we saw, clarifying our ideas, um, helping us to think through some working hypotheses that we have, and it really does take everybody to try to understand the complexity of this deep sea ecosystem. Hey, Daniel, Luke, you want to introduce yourselves and your projects? You want to talk about fingers or anything? Or? Why not? We have a little time. <coughs> okay, hello everybody. My name is Daniel Vogt. I'm a research engineer at uh, the Wies Institute, Harvard University. And um, doing these dives, we're going to try at some point squishy fingers, which are soft manipulators designed to pick up very delicate or deformable things underwater. Um, and the way it works, uh, these are fingers made out of rubber that when inflated um, with um, hydraulics will curl naturally and 
go around an object very delicately uh, to pick it up. So we're going to try these um, where we cannot use the usual grippers because they will be overpowered and um, crush the objects that we're going to pick up. Uh, so we're going to alternate when uh, the conditions are there uh, to pick up things with the soft actuators instead. Okay. That's it? Mm -hmm. You got nothing else to say? Um, yeah, we're going to try <laughs> several kind of actuators. Um, uh, yeah, I can get you that. Uh -huh. We'll put them up in a few minutes, yeah. Yeah, we're going to try different kind of actuators. Um, some new ones which have uh, optical sensors in it to know what, are, what is the state of the actuator, what's the curvature, but also uh, to get tactile sensing, to know if we are touching something or not. Uh, to estimate the pressures uh, interacting between the object and our gripper and to know, for example, if we dropped it, uh, we will be able to see this information. Um, we're also going to try some new actuators um, which have some nanofiber reinforcement and it allows us to have very fine, very small um, fingers to pick up gelatinous um, objects underwater um, without damaging the metal. Um, Which is going to be so helpful, I can't wait. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, We've already had a couple examples, right, of where we tried to pick something up and, uh, and we just said, squishy out. fingers, where are you? <laughs> yeah, they'll be coming. Um, you know, we had a question yesterday about how um, all of us got to where we are. Like, how do you get to be in this role as a scientist on this ship? And maybe you could tell us a little bit about your career path and how you, hmm. how you came to where you are. <clears throat> Um, how did we get, you know, how do we all get how, here, how this, uh, this existentially all speaking, happen. or, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, there was a collaboration at Harvard University between Robert Root and David Gruber, where um, we saw the opportunity of using soft robotics um, for deep sea exploration. Um, so soft robotics is a very hot topic um, nowadays. Um, it opens a new doors in terms of um, robotic manipulations. Um, you can think about using them um, to manipulate any kind of soft or deformable objects, like for example an egg. If we want to manipulate that with a um, hard-bodied gripper, one would need to know very precisely what are the di dimensions of the egg. And if one goes a little bit too uh, too far, it's very easy to break it. Yeah. So using soft manipulators um, makes that much easier. We don't need a lot of control into the manipulation of the object, we just actuate it and it will automatically conform to the object to pick it up very delicately, delicately without damaging it. And I've seen this. There's actually a movie that you can see too on the Schmidt Ocean Institute page, right? Where they picked Correct. up an egg. I think it was it's called like yeah. Egg Exciting. Egg Expectation. Uh, oh, no, it was, no, it was the experiment. Yeah. Oh, the great yeah. experiment. Oh, yeah. the puns are endless here. We can have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> so we were trying. Um, to pick up an egg with the this manipulator to check out how it works. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, we did. And you avoided the question of exactly, you know, if somebody wanted your job, how would they get there? Like, did I have to go to school for how long? What do you, what do you have to do to become an engineer? Um, so I studied microengineering in Switzerland. Um, I studied robotics and autonomous system, and I had the chance in 2011 to do um, my master project in the Harvard Microrobotics Lab. So during seven months, I was in Boston working on um, several projects. And um, I got hired in the lab to continue doing research and business development. And um, I'm working there since six years, and it's been a fabulous experience. Awesome. Yeah, working on lots of cool uh, stuff, including uh, soft robotics for the deep sea exploration. That's so cool. Yeah. You know, I have to admit, um, one of my favorite things about this cruise is the interface between biology and engineering. And, um, you know, with the ship's technology itself, but also with you, it's really, really fun to think about. Um, I mean, we were talking about this before, how you're using a drone, right, to look at birds and islands and look yeah. to look at the sub. Do some and, yeah. exploration of drones. Exactly. So it's this, it's this really nice intersection of all science in general, because we have sort of biology, natural history, geology, really interfacing with, yeah. you know, engineering and robotics. And it's just, yeah, it's awesome. I guess it brings a lot to a group to have all these people with different backgrounds and have them work together. It's really a very enriching experiments. It's really fun, yeah. I yeah. know. So, um, except for my kids, I mean, I could, and husband who I love, we could just live on the ship and just could make amazing science happen all the time. Absolutely. And we have a whole yeah. month, so we're good. Not stop. <laughs> cool. Okay. Awesome. Oh, we have a question for you. Um, what does it say? It says, how do your soft actuators work? How do they deal with the high pressures under the ocean? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so it's true that everything that we put at these depths 
is um, is quite tricky from a technical point of view to make it work that deep. Um, the way it works is that it's a soft, it's a robotic body. It's a sorry, a rubber body uh, that you inflate with water. And the only thing that it needs to work is a pressure differential. So even if we are that deep, we will have a pump that's on the robot and will make a pressure differential between uh, the pressure we see at uh, 2,000 meters and we'll add a little bit more pressure to make it curl. Um, so we are not really limited by uh, the surrounding um, huge pressure that we can see down at water. All we need is a difference of pressure and we need a pump that can work at these, uh, these depth and that's it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was, do you remember the very first CTD cast before we even got a chance to dive in the sub? We put a couple soft actuators. Yeah, um, to see if they survived. Yeah, just to see if they survived in the same container as we had our like styrofoam cups, which if you send them styrofoam cups down to the bottom of the ocean, all the They'll air shrink. comes out. Yeah, yeah, and they shrink and it's super fun. Um, and we were all placing bets on whether or not your actuators would implode. And uh, yeah. Daniel looked at all the rest of us and said, just said nothing, actually. You were very just calm, cool, and collected, because you yeah. knew they would survive, and sure enough, they came back completely whole. It was really impressive yeah, to watch. Yeah, I, I was pretty confident with the actuators, yeah. um, especially because they are fully infill. And they, these were special actuators that I 3D printed, and it was key to have a completely filled body, to not have any air trapped in that. So I knew the actuators would survive, but I wasn't sure about another part that I added in the basket that was uh, not fully infilled, and I was waiting that one to be crushed. Uh, but it still made it. So in the yeah. test of styrofoam cup versus 3D printed soft actuators, actuators the one, actuators one. styrofoam yep. cups zero. <laughs> one zero. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Awesome. So if you have any other questions for us, we have a little time. We've got a good group of expertise in the room, and you can ask your ask your questions on the YouTube live chat or on the Facebook live feed. I'm sorry, I don't entirely speak all this language, but I think that'll help. Um, and yeah, there we go. Okay, I'll get a picture of the oh, yeah, you, for Yeah, that. let's put that up on the screen. That'd be great. Thanks, Daniel. While Daniel's trying to get a picture of the soft actuators, I'm going to ask Luke to come up here. He knew that was coming. Uh, to talk to us about how he got on this ship. Hey everyone, uh, my name's Luke McCartan. I work with uh, Tim Shank in Woods Hole. Um, I'm actually a recent graduate from undergrad, a uh, research technician with Tim, and I'm very fortunate to be here. I met Tim when I was in high school. I actually volunteered in his lab and then uh, got my degree and came back and started working for Tim in June. So I've been uh, working full-time with Tim for the past four months and uh, it's been a very exciting experience and I'm very fortunate to be out here that Tim asked me to come. And um, so we are actually studying uh, deep sea corals and the animals that live on deep sea corals. So we are um, most interested in animals like crustaceans and echinoderms, um, specifically things that we will see down here will be squat lobsters, um, which are very cool little crustaceans, and um, also ophiroid, um, brittle stars and basket stars, which tend to wrap themselves up in corals and actually um, and catch uh, food that's passing by. Um, so we're interested in why they are living on certain corals, um, which animals live on which species and families of corals, and, um, and yeah, their behaviors and why they uh, choose to uh, climb up onto corals and um, live on them. I think I saw a primnoid. I don't know if we can get a zoom. We will zoom in a little bit. We're going to keep a nice wide view right now. Um, and just you know, keep taking in this gorgeous landscape, if that's okay with you. So um, one of the nice things about um, what Luke was just talking about is he actually comes from a terrestrial background. You're just getting your uh, your flippers this trip, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if you count, it counts getting flippers uh, when, I don't you're, know. Uh, when you're on a ship. Most Living on a ship, yeah. But you struggled um, a little bit. But yes, it, so I did some undergrad research on um, insects and uh, actually plant-insect interactions, so um, the insects that live on goldenrod, uh, the common wildflower. Um, I looked at an ant mutualism where ants and a bug called a tree hopper actually uh, have this symbiotic relationship where the tree hopper releases a, a sugar-rich honeydew secretion and the ant consumes that secretion to defend the tree hopper from other insects that might predate it. Um, and it might not sound anything like it would relate to deep sea biology, but in 
fact, I see a lot of similarities in species interactions on corals that we see on plants. It's just similar dynamics between species that compete for corals or the species that um, have this really, have their life history intertwined with uh, corals like uh, tree hoppers and ants do with goldenrod wildflowers. It's true, there are a lot of really similar sort of mechanisms of associations and trying to understand how mutualisms and in, both direct and indirect work in the deep sea and in the terrestrial world. And, you know, it's, it's not easy to study nature no matter where you are and what you're doing, but we've had a lot more experience studying terrestrial systems, mostly because they've been eaten, relatively easier access for us, and the technology to look in the deep sea has been relatively recent, and so we're just beginning to, you know, um, tackle some of those questions. As an aside, I, um, I've been thinking about uh, creating a, I don't know, something, maybe a book, I don't know what, but a deep sea botany for all of the leaf litter that we find in the deep oh, sea. Because, cool. you know, there is, there is certainly terrestrial influence all the way down here. And just the other day we saw uh, an ironwood leaf on the bottom, and Eric Cortez was mentioning to us that he sees uh, lily pads in the Gulf of Mexico, and really? yeah, all kinds of other stuff. So I really love the fact that um, it's fun to talk about goldenrods and leaf hoppers and ants in the deep sea, but you know, I wouldn't see the leaf hopper or the ant, but it would be possible to see some of the plants tumble down the hill. No goldenrod in this region. No. Not even close. So. Definitely not. 100%. I'm yeah. a well, botany nut. No. Not in the Pacific. They're invasive in you know, China, but that's that's miles away. It's not Ladego, totally native to New England where we live, so really nice to see it there. And this is the right time of year. This yeah, is the last burst of the flowers in the mid-October. Yeah. Really important source for pollinators. Yeah. Such a weird conversation to be having in the deep sea. you? <laughs> we have um, some in Daniel's video. Nope, pictures. Okay, so we're trying to still get some pictures of um, the soft-bodied uh, robots and the soft robotic actuators coming up, hopefully. Okay, we're still trying to get some pictures of the 3D actuators up online, but if you guys have any other questions, you can post them to the YouTube live chat or to the Facebook live page at the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Deb, our fabulous marine tech, is monitoring the channels and telling us um, what your questions are and putting them up on our screens, one of 37, ah, so that we can um, get a sense of um, what you want to know and try to answer it yep. because this is a cool opportunity for us to talk to you. You're all over the globe and um, poor you, you're stuck talking just to us, <laughs> but we'll do the best we can. Um, somebody's asking us how many more dives. Uh, we are on dive five of hopefully close to 20 here in the Phoenix Islands protected area. It'll probably our dives are long, yeah. and these are not six-hour dives. We're doing uh, like sometimes 20 to 24-hour dives, and so how many we get will be partially dictated by weather and distance transiting and science needs and length of dives. And so if we find something really interesting, we're going to stay and look at it. And um, some of that extra time may translate to fewer dives, but more time underwater when there's something good to see. So it's a really flexible system. and. Um, get as many as we can as many as we I mean, can we, get, we, we come right up and then we uh we don't take too much time trying to get a map of the next site and then we go right back in the water so yeah, yeah. the rhythm around here kind of goes something like this it's 
map. So the, we're in such a new territory that there's nearly no good 3D multi-beam maps of most of the sites we're diving. All we have is what the Okeanos produced earlier this year. And so we run over um, where we want to go with multi-beam. We get a good map. We come back in. Uh, the chief scientist on this cruise, Eric Cordes, has been doing a really great job with track planning. He'll make a quick, a really quick um, dive plan based on the multi-beam. Uh, it's been really fantastic to see it happen in real time. Then we will either dive or run a CTD cast for water samples, uh, one or the other, and then when we're done with one, we'll usually do the other, mm -hmm. and then um, run around to our next site, map it um, while everybody is setting up for the next CTD cast or dive. And while all of that da mapping and is happening, um, you might think that we'd be, you know, getting a rest or sleeping. Nope. We're in the lab processing all the samples from that dive, making sure that every itsy bitsy bit of sample is put to good use. So. We are um, preserving things in a variety of ways to look at for genetics or morphology. So liquid nitrogen and ethanol and uh, formalin and freeze drying and regular drying and what am I missing? That's, sounds about it. I don't know, glycerol stocks for Anna. RNA later. RNA, RNA later, RNA. yeah. <laughs> we got a bunch of stuff going on. We and then a few preservation methods for each sample so that we ensure that we get it home yep. safe and intact. And, and we've got some redundant sampling. So that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So God forbid we lose um, some, we can have the other, you know, have another set somewhere else because these samples are really precious and really hard to get. And, um, and then we also... Uh, look at them under the microscope, and sometimes uh, we have Anna Gauthier, who um, is a microbial, microbial ecologist, doing some actual experiments right here in the lab. So in real time, she's trying to figure out microbial composition and uh, uh, density, which is like usually around 10 to the fourth of the depths we've been working, but she's been confirming that. And uh, in some cases, really uh, taking a look at the change in density in different depths and measuring ocean chemistry with pH and also taking a look at um, looking for signs of pollutants with microplastics and a really great collaboration with per uh, Perkin Elmer. Uh, what else are we doing? We have a lot of things going on. We're busy. We're yeah. busy. We are very busy. <laughs> and so um, sleep. Sleep. When do, the reason sometimes we sound tired is because we are. <laughs> we get sleep in two to three hour blocks when they come. Um, Actually, I, I do. You're in a shift system, but you, yeah, you I've been a little better. I don't know about that because <laughs> what happens here's what happens in Luke's situation. He gets off shift, he stretches, he yawns, and then the ROV comes up, and he's got to work yes. in the lab till all hours. And then he is like, ah, the lab work's done. Time to get a meal. Time to stretch out. Time to take a shower. Oh wait, you're on shift again. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> that's kind of how it goes, doesn't it? Yeah. We did have a week-long transit, which was a. Uh, Quite relaxing though that was, was a, so yeah we were due for some hard work I think so yeah it's true we it's a, a six day transit from Hawaii to the Phoenix very, Islands very far away which is yeah it's hard to yeah. imagine but are you my favorite I was really trying hard to think about how to explain that to people because six days of just journeying from here to there it's hard to it's just hard to get how remote we really were and then somebody I, can't, I think it might have been Dean it might have been Russ but somebody on the ship said to me um at one point, while we were in the middle, middle, middle of the Pacific, and there was no airplanes, no ships, nothing for days and days, they said, you know, the closest people to us are on the space station. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And that was a moment where I was like, you know, it's, we are yeah. isolated. We're closer to things above us than we are on Earth. So. That's right. It's yeah. Closer to the stars than I've ever been. Yeah, it's true. When you think of it that way. Yeah. I love that. Kind of fits with the whole, like... That across the Pacific voyaging yeah it's concept been too. a big voyage I mean we were we were steaming at 10 knots 12 knots for six straight days night and day from Hawaii and a flight for a flight to Hawaii from Boston even was 12 hours so that right. that was a trip in and of itself and then kept going further I love your perspective on this Luke because um, Luke is just at the beginning of his wanderlust uh, stage of life and so yeah it's true yeah it is true this is not going to be the end for you, is it? I don't think so. <laughs> this is perhaps one of the most remote places to do. You're spoiled. To do work, though. Yeah. I'm You've had spoiled. a lot of firsts on this trip that I don't yeah. know if you're ever going to top. For example, no, yeah. snorkeling. You snorkeling in the Phoenix Islands protected area, yeah. which I have to tell you is a shallow coral reef biologist. is some of the best snorkeling you'll have yeah, in your my, entire life. My snorkeling experience was just 
put on a mask for five minutes off the beach so, and check it out. But uh, we went for an hour-long snorkel in one of the most beautiful, pristine reefs in the entire world. So yeah, and you saw tabletop really corals yeah. that were, you know, 20 feet in diameter. Saw, yeah. Turtles. Turtles, white tip reef sharks, and just beautiful. Squillions of fish, as my friend yeah. Rob Burrell <laughs> likes to say. Rob, if you're listening, we're thinking of you out here. My first trip to this place was on the Naya, which Rob owns, it's based out of Fiji, and uh, it's pretty great. So, um, yep, we're gonna uh, show you some pictures of 3D actuators. Okay, this is uh, Daniel speaking. So um, you should see on the screen um, two pictures of the soft actuators. Um, what you see here is in blue is the rubbery part. Um, it's a silicone rubber. So, and um, when it's inflated with air or water, it curls like you can see on the picture on the left. Um, this soft actuator was designed by Caitlin Becker in um, Harvard University. And you can also see that there's a layer of foam, the yellow part, to really make sure to not uh, damage at all uh, any delicate thing we'll find in, uh, in the water. Um, you can also notice that there's a reinforcement, the string that's going uh, back and forth between the units. And this is to prevent any radial expansion. Any radial expansion would mean less uh, curvature, so we want to avoid this. We want to have a pure curv curvature when we inflate uh, these actuators uh, with hydraulics. And we have different configuration. The one you see on this um, image is a four finger. We can also have two, uh, three, five. We can do have any kind of configuration. We can also have a palm um, with the actuators uh, facing each other and closing um, to like grasp something um, in different manners. Um, what else would be worth mentioning on this? Uh, you know what? I think we should save some surprises because mm -hmm. we have just decided to uh, come on up and maybe we'll get a chance to put, you know, try squishy fingers on our next dive. So, mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, I think, I think all this talk keep has made us really suspense. jealous. So, yeah, we'll keep you in a little bit of suspense so you'll tune in. We're actually going to surface and recover the ROV right now, maybe try a couple of things, including adding some squishy fingers the next time around. We'll mm -hmm. see if Sounds that good. works out. Let's give it a try. Yeah, we're always innovating here. So let's give it a try, right? Absolutely. All right, Let's we'll see it. you in a couple hours when we try diving again. I will uh, try to keep you posted on when that would be. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And um, if you're looking at this beautiful marine snowscape, um, keep that in mind, because in a few hours, we'll be descending back down to see more of the seafloor. Thanks, everyone.